before Robert Smith gets us going on this. Uh, some of the song books don't have all the lyrics, so if you check and you don't have them, they can have all the lyrics. So we're going back in time today with Hugh's talk, the founding of ethical culture. So we thought it would be appropriate if we went back in time and pulled out our very old, dusty, uh, black songbooks that uh, you have. And so I would like you to turn to 8B, which is an appropriate song because we're talking about the ethical. It was written by... Uh, it's from an Irish air that you all know, da, 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 but John Hogue put some ethical lyrics to it, so please join me in singing 8B. about the state of our nation. Uh, will the election bring us more intolerance and bigotry, or will it usher in greater tolerance and pluralism? I invite us to just take a deep breath and let it out with a sigh. In fact, I'll invite you to do a little more mindful breathing. Just take a moment to breathe in calm. Breathe out anxiety. Breathe in peace. Breathe out anger. Breathe in whatever you need. And let go of what you got to let go. Thank you. We are 
are going to need some equanimity to continue the work of ethical culture regardless of who wins this election. So today I want to remember that the grand task of given to us 149 years ago is still there. On May 12th of 1876, an influential group of organizers encouraged a dynamic young scholar by the name of Felix Adler to offer a public expression of a new way of living. Three days later, on Monday, May 15th in New York, Adler announced a series of Sunday lectures that were gonna begin in October of 1876. Now the words that he spoke on May 15th became known as the Founding Address, and today I'm gonna to share some of his words. Now Adler made sure to say that we should change things when we need to, we have to, uh, uh, follow his advice, but then adjust it. We have to evolve. He was very much in favor of that. So related to that, I actually edited some of his words, particularly some of the Victorian sexist language that was typical of his time. I hope that by exploring the birth of ethical culture, we'll be more grounded as we move into an uncertain future. Regardless of the election outcome, we must carry on the project that Adler began for us on May 15, 1876. All right, <clears throat> let me dive into this talk. When I say Adler's words verbatim, you will see them. <laughs> bring him back into the room in a non-supernatural way. So early on in that talk, he spoke a lot about the material progress. The late 1800s saw profound technological and vast advancements, which really bolstered our country's burgeoning confidence. He explained, eulogies on the 19th century are familiar to our ears, and orators delight to discount upon all the glorious things which it has achieved its railways, its printing presses, its increased comforts and refined luxuries. But so many commentators pointed out that for over a century our modern manufactured wealth has not satisfied our most profound desires. We build, Adler says, like bees without knowing why. Many people find themselves stuck on the treadmill of work for example. Those of us wealthy enough to enjoy some social abundance often find its rewards temporary and superficial. Adler writes, ragged and careworn, the merchant returns to his home in the evening. He finds his children weary, his own mind distracted. In these troublous times, business cares not unfrequently dog him, even into the seclusion of family circles. How then is he to discover that tranquil leisure, that serenity of the soul, which he needs to be a true father to his children? He cannot form their characters. He cannot justly estimate their needs. So as a result, Adler adds that we have to give character development of our children over to strangers. And what he meant by that was nannies or tutors or teachers or anybody they run into. Adler critiques efforts while this is going on for us to have a good time. Okay? He says, it has been said that the modern world is divided between the hot and hasty pursuit of affairs in the hours of labor and the no less eager chase of pleasure in the hours of leisure. But even our pleasures are calculated and businesslike. We measure our enjoyments by the sum expended. Our salons are often little better than bazaars of fashion. We wander festival halls, chewing artificial phrases, which we neither believe nor desire to be believed. We breathe a stale and insipid perfume from which the joy, the spirit of joy, has fled. The brief exhilaration of the dance, the physical stimulus of wine and food, 
the nervous excitement of a game of hazard, perhaps these make up the sum total enjoyment in by far the majority of our so-called parties of pleasure. Surely of all things melancholy in American life, American mirth is the most melancholy. So, unsatisfied, exhausted, it's no surprise that people were paying less attention to morality. Because it used to be that, for better or worse, we believed that religious institutions would help us live ethical lives. But as religion faded in importance during Adler's life, he explains, quote, before the assaults of criticism, many ancient strongholds of faith have given way, and doubt to fast spreading even into their circles where expression is forbidden. Morality, long accustomed to the watchful tutelage of faith, finds its connection loosened and severed, while no new protector has arisen to champion its rights. No new instruments been created to enforce her lessons among the people. As a consequence, we behold a general laxness in regard to obligations most sacred and dear. So in other words, Adler explains that while we've achieved immense intellectual and physical and industrial growth, our ethical character has stagnated. Now, moral improvement hasn't kept up with the material growth around us, and thus we drift, as Adler said, quote, on the seething tide of business. Great and unexpected evils have followed in the train of our successes, and that the moral improvement of the nation and the individual components has not kept pace with the march of intellect and the advance of industry. So what's left? What when obligations most sacred and dear slip away? From Adam's perspective, we're left scrambling for wealth and power. Soon after the Civil War ended, the U.S. abandoned those who were recently liberated from enslavement and forced immigrants to become wage slaves. And the U.S. wiped out indigenous populations that stood in the way. Corporate interests were becoming more powerful than governments and kings. Sound familiar? We often return lustfully to creature comforts after times of war and scarcity. It's pretty typical. After World War I, everybody went back to the roaring trains. After World War II, it led to the crazed consumerism of suburban 1950s. And after the Civil War, frenzied capitalism engulfed us. So Adler said that we were distracted, and this is what happens when we get lax regarding our obligations, most sacred and dear. According to Adler, an anxious unrest, a fierce craving, desire for gain, has taken possession of the commercial world. And in instances no longer rare, the most precious and permanent goods of human life have been madly sacrificed in the interests of momentary enrichment. We have already transgressed the limit of safety, and the present disorders of our time are but precursors of other and imminent dangers. The rudder of our ship has ceased to move obedient to the helm. We are drifting on the seething tide of business, each one absorbed and holding his own in the giddy race of competition each one engrossed in immediate cares and seldom disturbed by thoughts of larger concerns and ampler interests. So we risk drowning in this seething tide. We and our spirituality become engulfed by it. Quote, what is to keep our heart from freezing in chill despair? To keep our head high, our step firm, if it not be the deep-seated, long, and carefully matured conviction that people were set into the world to perform a great and unselfish work, independent of his comfort, independent of even his happiness, and that in its performance alone they can find true solace and lasting reward, to arouse such courage, to build up and buttress such a conviction, 
would this not be a loyal and much needed service? It would indeed. But who is going to take this on at this time? Were governments going to offer this much needed service? Would governments lead the efforts to reconstruct morality? <clears throat> Adler said, unfortunately, government run by unethical people cannot turn people ethical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Take that as you will. Where the roots of private virtue are diseased, the fruit of public propriety cannot but be corrupt. Now, maybe it was different at our founding, because Adler actually cited George Washington, who declared that national policy would be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. Unfortunately, Adler admits, pure and immutable principles have been sold for profit, including those made by those enslaved by Washington. He explained, there is not a morning's journal that reaches us that is not besmirched with tales of theft and perjury. The very names that ought to be held up as luminaries of honor have become bywords of villainy. And the foul stench of corruption fills our public offices. See how the nation in this festal epoch of her marriage to liberty stands blackened with the crimes of her first dignitaries and hides her head in shame before the nations. And for what have these miserable men bartered away their honor and that of the people for the same unhallowed and unreasoning desire of rapid gain? So Adler notes that there were reforms going on at the time trying to cure these great evils that he called, include civil service reform, include reform of primary elections, but these reforms all depend on the last upon the fidelity of those to whom the execution has been entrusted. They will all fail unless the root of the evil be attacked, unless the conscience of people be aroused, the confusion of right and wrong checked, and the loftier purposes of our being again brought powerfully home to the hearts of the people. So where, when, and how are these loftier purposes going to be brought to the hearts of the people? Well, after the reason that it can't be during the workday when we're on the carousel of capitalism, he suggests that since, in his early adulthood, most people didn't go to church on Sunday, that that day, that day of leisure, should be when these loftier purposes are brought to people. He said that America's Day of Rest should be, quote, used to further higher goals by meeting together, and thus began ethical culture in 1876. On Sundays, when the great machine of business pauses. Now, Adler believed that most people lived ethically not due to religious doctrines or authority. It was the presence and encouragement of other human beings. According to the Ethical Society of St. Louis website, Adler once said, it will be objected how it is possible to induce people to make their effort to be good, there being no authority or book or creed to lean on. The answer is that the method we must pursue is to put people in the midst of crowds, people who are themselves aflame with a desire for the good that can kindle in others the same desire. Now, that's confirmed by social science. While groups can lead people to do terrible things, being with others often brings out our best. Well, what do these gatherings look like? Well, Adler said first and foremost that they should be simple and devoid of formality, consisting primarily of music and a lecture. They would exclude prayer, quote, and ritual of every form. Now, this was important to Adler not because he was allergic to prayer or ritual. It was important to him because he did not want traditional, traditionally religious people to feel mocked for their beliefs and practices. 
He wanted to work with those of traditional faiths dedicated to a better world. He wanted, quote, to occupy that common ground where we may meet all believers and unbelievers for purposes in themselves lofty and unquestioned by any. For Adler, it was time to work together for the good and not bicker about differences. Now, he spoke a lot about how music can get folks together and working together. He talked about how it should be central to Sunday morning. He said, music, that divine comforter, which sometimes wins us to higher flights of emotion and speaks in its own wordless language of an ideal beauty and harmony far transcending the prosy aspirations which we confess. Without music, our life would be utterly blank and colorless. Music can elevate the heart and give rest to the feelings. I mean, even the most brilliant speaker could not express all the mysteries of the universe, but Adler insisted, quote, what he fails to express, what no language has ever spoken on earth can express, those nameless yearnings of the soul for something better and happier, far than aught we know of. Music will give them utterance and solve and soothe them. And he charged. <laughs> but after does cut most stock in the platform talk given each Sunday. It was to him the fire that burns on the altar of ethical culture. His talks were of very high quality, People flocked to hear him speak. The talks he said were glow like paintings of master artists. And that's an intimidating legacy to follow as an ethical culture. At that founding address in May of 1876, he promoted having trained clergy to do that. Many people have experienced how useful it is to have a clergy person during times of grief or at life passages. Adler spoke specifically quite a bit about births and marriages and formal memorial services or act of grave, as Adler called it. He said, in every case you turn to the specialist, trusting that you will obtain the best of what you need. Now, this specialist, he said, should be trained in the knowledge and communication, both, because I think in Adler's time, he went to school quite a bit, he learned that a lot of professors might be very bright but didn't know how to teach. So he said, quote, it's one thing to know and quite another to impart knowledge. That's true. So for ethical culture to flourish, you need somebody who shall throw all the energy of temper and ardor of aspiration and all the force of heart and intellect into this difficult and ever glorious work. So Adler saw clergy as important, despite having reservations about clergy, and religious institutions and hierarchy. In March of 1877, he gave a talk called The Priesthood of the Ideal. And he said that while, quote, the very name of the priesthood has become odious to the modern mind, he said we still needed some kind of ethical priest, non-theist imam, godless rabbi, or humanist minister, whatever you want to call it. They may not be needed forever, though. He explained, institutions and practices should evolve. In fact, should ethical culture succeed in cultivating goodness in everyone, ministers might no longer be necessary. That makes sense. In some ways. Should we get there? He said, quote, the time will come when individuals shall no more need to do when the time will come when individuals shall no shall no more be needed to do the ministry. When in the brotherhood and sisterhood of mankind, all shall be priests and priestesses one to another. So what would these talks look like on Sunday morning? Adler said there were two purposes primarily. The first was to illustrate the history of human aspirations, to trace the origin of many of those errors of the past whose poisonous tendrils still cling to the life of the present, but also to exhibit in pure and bright examples, and so to enrich the little sphere of our earthly existence 
by showing grander connections, so that we enlarge ourselves, and the soul for a time takes on the grandeur and excellency of whatever it truly admires. He continued, Secondly, it will be the object of the lectures to set forth a standard of duty, to make clear the responsibilities of which our nature as moral beings impose upon us. In view of the political and social evils of our age, and also to dwell upon those high and tender consolations which the modern view of life does not fail to offer us ever, even in the midst of anguish and affliction. So Adam made clear through examples that these talks were to be offered by those well-versed in religion and philosophy and history, for they will be drawing on the wisdom of past sages. He explains, it is not to him or her you listen, but to those countless others that speak to you through them in strange tongues, of which he is no more than a humble interpreter. So, being distracted by the rat race or burdened by our moral weaknesses, people need to bolster their ethical strength from the ground up. Something Adam talked about quite a bit. So moral education for children was particularly important. When parents are strung out by professional responsibilities or exhausted by long hours of labor, specialists in education would be needed. For too long, the young have been spiritually underfed, then and now in this country, and thrown into the workplace or out into the streets at too young an age. Adam said, we teach them to repeat some scattered verses of the Bible, some doctrine at which time in their life they can but half comprehend at best. And then, at 13 or 14, at the very age when doubt begins to arise in their young heart, when in its inefficient gropings towards the light, youth stands most in need of friendly help and counsel, we send them out to shift for themselves. So more is needed, which is why Adler focused on children. He organized one of the very first free kindergartens in the United States. And he appreciated that all of us need to be educated well, to flourish well. Central to the mission of the New York Society for Ethical Culture was improving religious knowledge, opinions, and providing moral instruction for children, and cultivating the knowledge of one's own worth and the worth of others. Now, he began that work earnestly on October 15th of 1876 with a series of lectures exploring the world's major religions, the lives in particular of their sages. He particularly spoke on Buddha and Luther and Spinoza and Jesus. Now, maybe this was necessary to help people of traditional faith sort of transition into ethical culture, and it might have helped them focus less on a supreme being and more in a supreme way of being, because you talk about the people in those religions. And then in January of 1877, he began teaching about a new idea. Now, he had studied phil philosophical idealism in Germany, particularly Immanuel Kant, and he emphasized that transforming human beings into more ideal beings takes work. Now, there was already a religion of humanity in Europe who was founded by Auguste Comte. He copied traditional religious calendars and forms, but Adler found it was too reverential of human beings, given our feet of clay. Adler rejected traditional religious approaches, however, to dealing with evil, particularly those emphasizing hell and avoid only doing good to avoid God's wrath. We should leave behind, he insisted, the antiquated traditional equating of morality with obedience. For too long, that's been the assumption. And as superstitions fade, and fewer people believe in traditional religious beliefs, some say that the ethical gods for life disappeared. They might agree with Dostoevsky, who said, without God, everything is permitted. Adam said that evil will fade only when people under 
understand that they'll be better off living in communities that nurture flourishing relationships and that bring out the best in others and themselves. By affirming the worth and dignity of every person, we'll find ourselves lifted out of the struggle and alienation flanking us all. Now, this transformation is made easier when we engage in lifelong education. So this is where Adler lays out, in its early form, the uniqueness of ethical culture. It's grounded in the words, deed before creed. On May 15th of 1876, he explained, the freedom of thought is a sacred right of every individual person, and diversity will continue to increase with the progress refinement and differentiation of the human intellect. But if differences be inevitable, nay, welcome, in thought, there is a sphere in which unanimity and fellowship are above all things needful. Belief or disbelief, as he would list, we shall at all times respect every honest conviction, but be one of us where there is nothing to divide in action. Diversity in creed, unanimity in deed. That is the practical religion from which none dissent. That is the common ground where we may all grasp hands as brothers united and sisters united in mankind's and womankind's common cause. But Adler did believe that where some common grounds included some basics that were taken for granted at that time, things like we should avoid corruption, help the suffering, raise the oppressed, and comfort the weary. And that leaning is clearest in Adler when he turns to one of his heroes, and that was the person who was Jesus Christ, which often surprises a lot of people in ethical culture. But near the end of his opening address, Adler said, Jesus of Nazareth said that he came to comfort the weary and heavy laden. The philosopher affirms that the true service of religion is in the unselfish service, service to the common wheel. There is no difference among them. So there's this naive faith about unity that runs through a lot of the final passage of Adam's speech. He says, let religion unfurl her white flag over the battlegrounds of the past and turn the fields she has desolated so long into sunny gardens and embowered retreats. Thither let her call the traveler from the dusty hydra of life to breathe a softer, purer air laden with the fragrance of flowers of wonderland and musical with sweet and restful melody. There shall he bathe his spirit in the crystal waters of the well of truth and thence proceed upon his journey with fresh vigor and new elasticity. Sometimes it's a little bit too much for me, but we could all be a little last off there. And he ended his talk with this challenge. He said, the time calls for action. Up then, and let us do our part faithfully and well. And oh, friends, our children's children will hold our memories dearer for the work which we begin this hour. Now, Adler hit the ground running. He continued to deliver talks that were published in the New York Times, and young religious liberals, whether they're Jewish or Christian or secularists, embraced Adler's emphasis on practical ethics. It provided an outlet for the social idealism that was rising at the time in the late 1800s in the reformers and progressives like Jane Addams, the Southern House pioneer. And Adler's form of social action shifted away from paternalistic charity towards the empowerment of others. In that way, he's about a century ahead of his time. Adler's form of social action was one where he said, look, if you're going to empower somebody, they've got to be healthy. So one of his very first projects was sending a nurse to some poor areas of the city. And it began with one nurse, Effie Benedict. And it soon expanded into the visiting nurse service that was directed by Lillian Wall of the Hudson Street settlement. He proceeded to address poverty, tenement house issues, and what he called the labor problem, as the New York Times reported on April 4th of 1878. Adler sees danger in the present.
depressed condition of things, in the concentration and glut of laborers in the city, the hostile feelings between labor and capital, the lack of intelligence on the one hand and the want of sympathy on the other, the absence of recognition of the humanity and manhood and womanhood of toiling millions, the laboring class is to be cruelly and permanently benefited, must feel and seal and won't see, the more fortunate and prosperous have their interests at heart and are willing to help them to help themselves. They have the right to live, meaning the right to work, the right to cleanliness, the right to be private and virtuous, which in the crowded and poisonous tenement houses of the city they can never enjoy. So he joined the New York State Tenement House Commission. He was very concerned about the overcrowding and disease. He promoted tenement reform and reduced rents. And in 1885, Adler and others helped build some of the first low-rent tenements models for the country. That was ethical progress. Now, by the late 1800s, when international conflicts began to become a great concern and returned to questions of American foreign policy, some of the contemporaries saw the 1898 Spanish American War as a liberation of Cuba, but many others condemned U.S. militarism in the Caribbean and the Philippines. So Adler became the vice president of the Anti Imperialist League, resisting U.S. interventionism. He helped organize the 1911 International Race Congress held in London. And he resisted the vengeful Versailles Treaty and offered an alternative called the Parliament of Parliaments, which was a less retributive post-war peace plan. Domestically, when progressives were pushing for municipal, state, and national reforms and initiatives, ethical culture began supporting the government's work there. Adler became the founding chairman of the National Child Labor Committee in 1904. He served as a mediator when textile strikes tore up New York right before World War I. And in the last decades of his life, he focused mainly on fairness before the law and equitable access to resources. In 1917, he began serving on the Civil Liberties Bureau, which would become the American Civil Liberties Union. And he was on the first executive board of the National Urban League. As I conclude today, I want to look back on the founding of ethical culture through Adler's eyes. He shared his candid assessment of his life's work at the 55th year anniversary of the founding of ethical culture. He said, with deep gratitude, I think of those who first asked me to lead them along a new path and who followed so devotedly. They have all passed away, and others, thousands by this time, who succeeded them have passed. A great possession, a great procession. I greet them in the meditative hours. Their faces are not mournful, not mournful. Their extended arms point forward. They were interested in the future, in something great to be. And they put their trust, not in a person, but in an idea. What was the motive that appealed to those who first joined it? I answer, it was the desire to be rid of their, in their lives of the burden of falseness, the burden of ceremonies of religion, which to them were not true. Dedicated to freedom of thought, respectful of the worth of others, Adler promoted ethical culture with a light touch. We're not great proselytizers in ethical culture. Adler knew that the harsh tactics of some traditional religions, and he refused to employ them. He explained, I do not invite you to accept my religion. I ask you to consider the practical directions for the conduct of life which follow from it. And if after having tested them, you find them valid in your experience, then they will be of use to you. Those committed to ethical culture are humbled in the work. He was humbled in his work. At that 55th anniversary, Adam described them this way. They are not the holier-than-thou kind. 
They are not puffed up with spiritual pride, the poorest kind of pride imaginable. No, they are characterized rather by a profounder humility, a more poignant sense of their own imperfection. For me, this is deeply important in ethical culture. I think it's so important to acknowledge our own perfection and the imperfections of our ethical society and the ethical movement and our imperfections of this nation. But what's most important is what I emphasized at the beginning, and that is, regardless of how things go in the election, our work continues. This work continues in the United States, at the Ethical Society, and in ourselves. I'll close with some final words from that speech that he gave in 1931 two years before he died, and I do so in a way to reach back to him in time like he was reaching forward to us today. He said, and now in closing I turn to the future, to those whom we commit our trust, to our unknown successors in the generations and generations. Across the gulf of years I send them my greeting in the hope that long after my voice shall have been still, an echo of what has been said on this anniversary day will reach them, urging them to carry on so as to bring near the day when the sublime vision which hitherto has been seen but faintly and intermittently shall, set, shall shed its full radiance on a transfigured humanity. Thanks for listening.